Hello everyone and good day to you. This is Tracy Harrison from the School of Applied Functional Medicine. Today's topic is the cardiovascular system um, and dis-ease in that system. And if you've engaged with us before at all, you know here at SAFM we are passionate about the notion of dis-ease, which is a, a lighter word, a word even in the way we say it, it implies something that is probably addressable, something that can be remedied, something that can be reversed. And we certainly know through the conventional, excuse me, through the functional medicine lens, that if you can engage early enough, ideally as proactively or even preventively as possible, we can find the true root causes of cardiovascular dis-ease in each unique person and actually make them go away. Uh, the, the goal ultimately would be to engage early enough in order to educate, inspire, and empower a unique individual individual to make the lifestyle change that would naturally allow the cardiovascular system and its entire integration into the systemic human body to thrive, to return to its natural state of vitality. We do not agree that the natural progression of the body is eventually toward one of disease, dysfunction, multi-prescription suckedness, where our lives get longer, but we lose the vitality in them. We take a stand for the opportunity to engage earlier, ideally well before uh, dis-ease and dysfunction becomes bad enough to finally be diagnoso diagnosable. We are massively missing out on the opportunity to make a difference by waiting. We watch lab markers progressively trend year by year out of the normal range. And then we say, oh my gosh, this is high now. Maybe we should do something about it. When we start to look at lab markers more from the viewpoint of, is this functioning optimal? Not, not is it normal or not. Normal is just what 95% of the human population has. And when we have chronic lifestyle disease epidemics, friends, we all know, our deeper wisdom knows, there is a ton of disease just waiting to become bad enough to be diagnosable inside of reference ranges. And what people are doing on a day-to-day -day basis that's making them trend year, out of year, year by year, uh, progressively out of the reference range, unless we let them know otherwise, unless we bring them education, inspiration, and empowerment, they're going to keep doing what they've been doing because they like it. It's their habit. It's what's working for them. And they are counting on us to give them insight that they don't have today, to give them insight that what they're doing, that diet they think is oh, so healthy, is not at all. It's full of toxins. It's precipitating insulin resistance. But when we start looking at markers like fasting insulin, like hemoglobin A1C, like fasting glucose, and begin to understand from what published medical research shows us, there's a whole ton of insulin resistance inside of the normal reference range that again is just trending year over year outward. So I'm going to start with the message of we need to start looking more uh, prevent with a preventative lens, with a proactive lens, with a disease uh, reversal lens on getting in front of dysfunction. Um, I really think that we should be in this modern day and age, especially here in the Western world, we should be looking at fasting insulin for every adult as part of an annual physical. We need to be looking not just at fasting glucose, but hemoglobin A1C, because fasting glucose, as we know, is just a one single point in time. It is a particular point of fasting glucose that is highly affected, not just by someone's ongoing metabolic function, reflective of the liver and the pancreas, etc., but it's highly affected by people's first morning cortisol awakening response. And this, by the way, comes back to a powerful truth that people's blood sugar control their metabolic function is not just about what they eat and whether it's the standard American diet that's laden with excessive carbohydrates relative to their activity level and laden with highly refined carbohydrates and lots of sugars and sweeteners, stress increases blood sugar. And so people can eat the perfect diet, you know, they and they may legitimately be eating a pretty ideal diet. But if their world, if their day-to-day -day world is a madhouse of stress, and keep in mind, the body doesn't give a crap how non-stress 
stressful you tell yourself your life is or how you tell your friends, you tell your social media community, the body knows the truth. The body knows the reality of your stressful state. The body is listening to our thoughts and our ruminations and our belief systems and the crap we tell ourselves moment over moment over day over day over week over month over year and you know the body's pretty much with it it knows the truth of our stressful state and stress in the name of survival increases blood sugar all by itself and i even in my own clinical practice not to mention that of the thousands of practitioners in our safm family see over and over and over again that yes diet absolutely crap diet has a huge impact on increasing uh, blood sugar which is creating glycemic damage to the lining of our arteries which promotes endothelial dysfunction which creates hypertension which sets up the oxidative damage that the body naturally wants to uh, help repair and protect with deposition of cortisol excuse me deposition of cholesterol and eventually deposition of calcium in the name of healing by the way we'll talk about that more in just a second that leads to gross endothelial dysfunction that puts too much stress on the heart that causes a, a buildup of um, some sort of a blockage that results in a cardiovascular uh, event right this is one of the most common progressions of cardiovascular disease and if we want to reverse this dynamic if we want to prevent it we've got to get as far as possible upstream in the chain of causality. Conventional allopathic medicine is a wonderful practice. It is truly life-saving and the triage and stabilization that it can provide, especially in emergency and acute situations, is critically important. But we've got to stop using that wait for the badness to happen approach in the arena of chronic lifestyle diseases. If I have had an accident or an injury uh, or I have an acute infection, then that allopathic practitioner-centric conventional lens is really important and very effective by the way, a tremendous blessing. But if I'm looking at chronic lifestyle disease that is usually brewing for years or decades before it becomes bad enough to be diagnosable, I've got to ideally find the chain of interconnectedness of causality and step by step move as upstream as possible in order to get in front of that freight train that's roaring downhill so that we can stop uh, the flow of badness upstream and then naturally everything that is downstream from it the the uh, tissue in the heart the mitochondria in the heart the fluidity of the arteries the health of the lining of the arteries our cholesterol functioning, our glycemic control, all of that will get better because we are progressively step-by-step step, moving upstream to improve and reduce the runaway nature of the chain of causality that promotes the epidemic of diagnosable disease that we have today. So yes, my friends, blood sugar is where we've got to start. We need to look at fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C because lots of times people will have a crazy aggressive cortisol awakening response, which boosts first morning fasting glucose aggressively, which is a sign of the hypervigilance of the nervous system, which is not a good thing, by the way, because stress hormones may protect us uh, through systemically from the effects of stress. But stress hormones wreak massive oxidative havoc on a number of tissues, especially Especially on the lining of our arteries. So when you have stress hormones plus the elevated blood sugar plus the chemicals from the crap food that we eat when we're stressed, by the way, all uh, rising in quantity to constantly be punching with oxidative pot shots with the lining of our arteries, folks, it's no shocker that that turns into endothelial dysfunction uh, fairly quickly uh, with sustained lifestyle choices. Hemoglobin A1C shows us much more realistically what the level of glycemic control has been around the clock for multiple months, uh, typically for like a three month period for men, more like a two or so month period, especially for women who are still have menstrual bleeding. And when you see a really high first morning fasting glucose, but then a much more seemingly optimal hemoglobin A1C, we need to respond to that. We need to get at what is causing that surge first thing in the morning. 
Uh, another pearl for you is that the progression of metabolic dysfunction does not go from optimal blood sugar to high blood sugar. Nay, nay, nay. That's not how it works. We start with the body in its wisdom, in its strength and resiliency, handling, managing, tolerating for a really long time the crap that we ask it to, to tolerate. Uh, and in particular, the, the typical trio of true root causes of disease, especially in the modern Western world, crap food, toxins, and stress. All three of those wreak serious havoc on the entire cardiovascular system. And we've got to start intervening earlier. So, uh, when we have, um, when we have this, this buildup of blood sugar, excuse me, of glucose demand from higher stress hormones, from, um, high glycemic dietary choices, from excess sweeteners, the glucose load of our lifestyle increases, increases. And you know what? It's fine because the pancreas says, I got you. No worries. And the pancreas keeps pumping out more insulin. I got you. No problem. Right? I'm going to just pump out more escorts to grab that glucose to force it into the cells. And for a long time, the body handles that really well and insulin sensitivity remains optimal. But eventually we start to put out higher and higher and higher levels of insulin to manage what's happening. And uh, eventually we see a dynamic called insulin resistance. And there are a lot of uh, dynamics that tend to be happening at the same time. Uh, it's so interesting that our approach to this, when the cell is clearly telling us through its wisdom, I don't want any more glucose. I don't want it. It's so fascinating that us in our human wisdom, uh, which is fairly short-sighted compared to the ancient wisdom of the human body, we think we know better than the human body and the right answer is to just keep forcing that glucose into the cell. What would it be like if we started thinking about insulin resistance as being a natural um, protective survival mechanism of the human body and that insulin resistance is a positive thing? that the cell is basically saying, I don't want any more glucose. I can't handle any more glucose load internal to the cell uh, because my uh, antioxidant capability is already being stressed. My glutathione uh, capability is already being stressed. The wisdom of the body to say the mitochondria are already struggling from such an aggressive glucose load. Stop giving it to me. But our wisdom is in, in conventional medicine is not to say, whoa, the body's telling us something. Hmm, maybe I should reduce the glucose load of my lifestyle. We don't say that. We say, body, you don't know what you're talking about. Force the insulin in. Let's take lots of drugs to force the pancreas to make even more insulin, right? And to force the uptake of it. Toward what end? We expect the body to like this and tolerate it. And then we wonder that our tissue begins to really, really struggle. Uh, this is not surprising uh, at all. And we start to see the increase of intro uh, myocellular fat. We start to see the addition of uh, fatty liver, these kinds of dynamics, because we're forcing this tissue to take up excess glucose that it doesn't want. So I I uh, have done entire Facebook lives before on just um, insulin resistance and metabolic function. And so I'm not going to keep diving into this anymore because you can go access that uh, video if you wish. But suffice it to say, uh, the most common underlying dynamic uh, or sorry, mechanism with regard to um, uh, precipitating cardiovascular disease is indeed metabolic dysfunction. And that includes insulin resistance and the multiple stage. That's a big part of the runaway train that's heading downfield. But I really want all of us to remember that that is not just about food. It is also about stress. And in fact, if you want to actually write down what I believe is by far the number one root cause uh, the most prevalent root cause of the epidemic of chronic lifestyle disease, cardiovascular disease that we have today, it's stress. And it's all interconnected, of course, because when we feel stressed, we do things that promote all of the other root causes of disease. When we have lots of stress, we don't manage it very well. So we tend to self-medicate with alcohol, with cigarette smoking, with recreational drugs, with lots of mind-numbing television, with lots of crap food, with lots of sugars and sweets. We don't tend to sleep as much or we don't sleep as well. So we don't get the 
massive healing effects of rest, of being flooded with melatonin, which is a super powerful antioxidant. And by the way, one of the most important things that heals the lining of arteries overnight, which is why, by the way, part of the natural functioning of the cardiovascular system is to allow us to be big dippers overnight. Uh, your blood pressure naturally takes a precipitous drop uh, overnight. Big dippers live longer. Big dippers are way less likely to have cardiovascular disease because your blood pressure is dropping in order to reduce uh, the workload of the endothelial lining of our arteries so that they can heal richly bathed and nourished in melatonin, which is surging overnight. And melatonin, my friends, does not surge in the face of high cortisol, not because the body's broken, not because the body is weak, but because cortisol and melatonin naturally have strong antagonistic uh, properties. Because if you're in sympathetic dominant nervous system mode and you're stressed and you're fighting and fighting and hiding and fighting and fighting and hiding, and in a long-standing evolutionary sense, if you're hiding in a cave or running for your life, trying not to get stabbed or killed, it is super critical that you don't sleep very deeply because you could get eaten or killed in your sleep. Uh, the body allows us to only sleep very lightly. This is part of the body's natural mechanism for protecting us. Uh, we've got to stop fighting the body's wisdom. Good medicine is about understanding and accepting the wisdom, the intelligence of the body and harnessing it, working with it, supporting it. No wonder healthcare and medicine is so exhausting and so hard to find drugs that naturally work by countering or trying to fake the body into doing something different than what it naturally wants to do. Friends, we're all really smart individuals. That's just dumb. Again, it really works well for acute or emergency uh, type of uh, interventions that are really necessary. But for chronic lifestyle diseases, right? We got to change our chronic lifestyle if we want to have a different disease result, right? If you don't change the input, you're not gonna get a different output. So we need to start looking at fasting insulin. We need to start looking at hemoglobin A1C. We've got to start looking at fasting glucose. I think that should be part of every annual physical. The other effect of stress is a natural preparation for survival. Well, many of us are aware of the fact that people can white coat, right, for um, something like a, a higher blood sugar level. And many of you are aware that you can white coat, right, during a, a doctor's office visit for having higher cholesterol. But do you know that that can be as much as like 30 points? The body is really responsive and thinking that uh, we're measuring lab markers that are necessarily reflective of everybody's day-to-day -day norm is also just illogical. The body is adapting in every moment to the choices we're making in order to help us to survive as a first priority and then to thrive as a secondary priority. And so if you're encountering strong stress, strong stress like, oh my God, I got to go to the doctor's office. They're going to tell me how bad it is. I'm going to have to weigh myself. I'm going to learn just how bad my blood pressure is. I'm going to have to wait. Uh, and I know they're going to make me wait too long. I'm going to be late for work. And then I'm going to have to drive there. And somebody cut me off in the traffic. And I had an argument with my spouse. And I didn't get up in time. And I had to set an alarm clock. And whew, I'm stressed just telling that story. But it's fairly typical of what we might expect when someone has to derail their daily routine in order to go in and get a fasting morning blood draw. Crap, they haven't even had coffee yet. So yeah, they're in a stressed state. But it's not just their fasting glucose that may be even further exacerbated and an abnormal representation of their normal. Their cholesterol may be up dramatically, right? Especially their LDL. But what else is going to go up? Lots of things uh, may shift in the name of stress. One of the most important ones is fibrinogen, right? I really think we should start to look at fibrinogen uh, because this is an, an indication of the uh, readiness to clot right, of our um, our blood flow. And it's a good thing to remember that, yes, uh, clotty, thick, uh, heavy, viscous, uh, clot-prone blood can absolutely increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. But the reason why your cholesterol would go up, your triglycerides would go up, your blood sugar would go up, your fibrinogen would go up in the name of stress is so you don't die on the battlefield. You don't die in the cave after you got stabbed by the marauder that you've been running from 
down for the past week. Right? There's a reason why in a sympathetic dominant nervous system mode, the body aggressively, not mildly, my friends, but aggressively de, excuse me, deprioritizes certain functions and highly prioritizes other ones. When you're in fight or flight mode, fight, flight, or hide mode, the body doesn't give a crap about digestion or uh, immune function or healing wounds or detoxification. All those things that your patients want the body to care about. But when we're making day over day choices that are about crap food, toxins, and stress, crap food, toxins, and stress. And now I'm going to ruminate about my crap food, toxins, and stress. Go, go, go. Do, do, do. More, more, more. Help, help, help. Right? Stress, stress, stress. We create a permanent sympathetic dominant nervous system mode. And so, yeah, people have IBS and mild digestion. Yeah, people have hyperglycemia. Yeah, people have insomnia. Yeah, people have high viral load and poor wound healing and toxic overload and hepatic biliary congestion. My friends, we got to stop being surprised by this crap. This is not a surprise. This is total, natural, expected, physiological response of a healthy human body. Why are we spending our, our time, our focus, our intelligence on fighting that stuff rather than expecting it and getting in front of educating people about their health outcomes are a direct reflection of their choices that they're making knowingly or unknowingly. Their response in the face of the dynamics in their life that are precipitating dysfunction in the human body, that's really the body showing you what a champion is at sympathetic dominant nervous system mode, which is never, ever, ever, ever helped us to thrive. It's not supposed to help us thrive. That's not what it's supposed to do because the body doesn't give a crap about you thriving until the body is sure that you're going to survive to see another day. And then it might help you to thrive. It may help you uh, in order to have great skin, great digestion. You want to get pregnant? Want to have great orgasms? Want to have good bowel movements? Want to heal that paper cut on your, your left index finger? Want to feel better? Want to have great moods? Want to be relaxed? Want to sleep like a baby? All of these things, right? These are associated with a parasympathetic nervous system mode and the body is not going to go there until it is sure that it is safe to do so. The body is not going to go there unless we give it cues and clues consistently that our survival is assured and that our body can safely shift from survival as a priority to thriving as a priority. And here's the thing, my friends, they need to hear it from you because they can, they give to you whether you ask for it or not. In our modern world, you as a healthcare practitioner are an authority. You even rise to the height of being a guru, right? Uh, many people in our uh, modern day and age abdicate their health to you because they have been taught to believe somewhere deep down, maybe early back in childhood, maybe through just the popular health media, that they are not smart enough. They are not capable enough uh, to manage their own health and wellness. So they're abdicating it to you. They are looking to you for education. And if their lifestyle matters, they need you to tell them that it matters. They need you to be that messenger. They need you to educate them about how it works, how and why their choices matter. They need you to inspire them that diseases are reversible, that they can indeed make change. And yeah, 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 it's crazy simple, but it's not straightforward and it may not be easy at all because in order to be healthy in our modern uh, Western culture, you gotta be weird. Being healthy, uh, I love my friend Pilar's book, Healthy Deviant, right? You gotta be a deviant in today's culture to be healthy. There is nothing normal or socially acceptable or common uh, about eating healthy food, about ordering from the side menu on a particularly uh, crap laden menu because at least you know what a side of shrimp and a side of steamed broccoli and a plain sweet potato, at least you know that's food, right? As opposed to all these viscous chemical laden sauces that are poured all over um, uh, some kind of main dish with a, a pound of some kind of starch on the side. Right? You got to be weird. You got to be a unicorn. You got to be willing to be abnormal and different. And people need support. 
to be different. People need to learn to see being a healthy deviant as not a shameful thing, not an embarrassing thing, not something they want to avoid or hide from, but something that they're proud of, something that they're supported to do. And yes, we need better healthy deviant communities, platforms where people can come together and learn together and share their ideas and cook together and this type of thing. But people also need you to tell them the truth. So whether you're a physician or a PA or a nurse practitioner or a nutritionist or a dietitian or a midwife or a pharmacist or a physical therapist or a health educator or a health coach or a psychologist or a psychotherapist or a body work specialist or a yoga teacher, wherever you show up, an acupuncturist, a chiropractor, uh, an osteopath, right? Wherever you show up in the healthcare world, People need you to tell them the truth. Their lifestyle doesn't just matter, it's everything. Diseases are preventable. Chronic lifestyle diseases are reversible. It's so much easier to reverse them if you don't let them happen in the first place. They need to be inspired about what the possibilities are and then they need you to empower them with tools. Either you yourself or via referral to some other program, some other platform, some other practitioner in your own multimodality practice, in your clinic, uh, or in your referral network, right? Because lifestyle choice is everything. Okay, so we talked about crap food. We're talking a lot about stress. We need to be looking at fibrinogen. We need to be educating people that if they want the most reliable lab work imaginable, they need to take a lot of care for what happens in the morning before they come to the lab. It's not just a matter of first morning fasting. First of all, people need you to, need you to tell them what first morning fasting actually means because I got news for you. A lot of people are having one or two or four cups of coffee before they come get their first morning lab work because they don't mean... They don't know that fasting means no coffee. Uh, they don't mean that they don't know that fasting means no protein shake because after all, I didn't chew anything, right? Um, or that fasting means the ice cream I ate at two in the morning when I, you know, felt stressed and got up and wandered down to the kitchen. Oh, sorry, was that? Did that interfere with my lab work? Right? They need you to educate them about what that means so that they literally have ten to twelve hours with water only. But they need to be taught to get up a little earlier, take your time, because your lab work will be highly affected by unusual stress. Do not get labs right after vacation. Do not get labs right after you had a massive argument with someone. Do not get labs uh, right after a loved one died, right? Uh, get up early enough to have an easeful morning. Plan ahead of time. Leave for lab work earlier. If you have a super stressful morning, reschedule it. Um, do the best we can to get representative lab work. There are going to be aspects of it that are affected by the abnormality of having a venipuncture first thing in the morning. But the best that we can do to create our typical normal will help us to get lab work that is relevant. When fibrinogen is beginning to uh, trend uh, upward, right? In the upper half of the reference range is associated with higher incidence of cardiovascular events. That's the place where you can start asking, hmm, your body is registering a higher level of vigilance, like it might need to protect you. Let's talk a little bit about why that is. So uh, we've got to intervene with education, inspiration, and empowerment, but let's take it to the next level, right? Let's talk about cholesterol because uh, we've got to get out from under telling people that their LDL uh, is because they're eating too much fat. Woo, if that is really your understanding, please, please, please let us or somebody bring your technical education up to uh, our current understanding of medical science because First of all, LDL, right, low density lipoprotein, little baskets that we carry cholesterol around in the body. We got to stop calling that the bad cholesterol. That is a tremendous disservice because all it's doing is making people afraid of all cholesterol. And that is not true. Cholesterol is a critical building block of every cell in the body. And we need cholesterol in order to build new cells, in order to heal cell membranes, right? In order to make steroid hormones, by the way. Uh, if you don't have raw ingredients, you can't make the biochemical um, compounds that need it. You know, I like to say, hey, no lettuce, no salad, right? You don't get to make up raw ingredients. 
So cholesterol is a necessity. Can too much cholesterol in a really uh, pro-disease environment stimulate cardiovascular events? Absolutely. But fix the environment as opposed to micromanaging uh, the potential trigger, right? We got to go upstream, right? Address the runaway train before it starts heading downhill. Go upstream and in the cha uh, chain of causality. So um, LDL is the one carrier of all cholesterol from the liver to serve the entire body. Might some of that cholesterol be deposited as a natural part of your immune function to help uh, heal and stabilize damage to the lining of arteries? Yes. But that LDL is also going to be delivering cholesterol to the entire rest of the systemic body for a whole bunch of really important functions. This is why we see, especially as we get older and into our upper 60s and beyond, why having lower LDL is actually an independent risk factor of death from all causes, not just cardiovascular disease. But we've got to start looking at when the body is increasing LDL, stop trying to force that to stop. Again, the body is not stupid. Instead, where in our wisdom would we honor the evolutionary brilliance of the human body to say, hmm, why are you doing that? Why, why are you increasing my LDL? What is that a reflection of? And how do I listen to the body's wisdom and engage with that in order to help the body to make different choices? Well, like I said, the body naturally increases a number of different inflammatory factors to keep you from dying because the body senses you're in a sympathetic dominant nervous system mode. And if you're going to have to fight, flight, and hide, the body at a minimum is going to keep you from bleeding to death. And so, yeah, your fibrinogen goes up to keep you from bleeding to death on the, the battlefield. Your cholesterol goes up to aid immune response. The, the cholesterol level goes up because your body is already sensing. There's a whole bunch of wounds in our arteries. We're not sure how they got there, but we need to protect you from these wounds. Whew. And so we need to start educating uh, that to stop focusing on stop eating cholesterol. So because it's a crazy ancient myth at this point that dietary cholesterol linearly transmits into uh, serum cholesterol. Liver is fully capable of making way more cholesterol than anyone would ever want to eat, even the best of our paleo buddies. But we, we've got to start reassuring the body that it doesn't need to do that. And part of that is reducing our stress, reducing our toxins exposure and intake, and reducing our insulin dysfunction. Uh, but uh, when we think about elevated LDL for men, my clinical experience is the most common root cause for that is going to be stress, especially with uh, many men. And this is a stereotype, but I find it to be more true than not, especially masculine energy, which is very much about protection and defense. And we protect ourselves by attacking, right? And so there's a lot of aggressive energy there that can lead to higher levels of epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol that stimulate the body to naturally produce higher levels of cholesterol and elevate LDL to carry it around. For women, the most common cause for sure is not that actually. If you go further upstream, the most common precipitating root cause for women of that is subclinical hypothyroid function, which naturally increases serum levels of cholesterol. Uh, when we have a, a suboptimal uh, cellular cellular thyroid function, we naturally uh, develop a, a rich diversity of cellular insufficient action throughout the body. And I say if we say all the time, sluggish thyroid, sluggish anything, maybe sluggish everything. Most of us are aware that hypothyroid function can turn into uh, sluggish gastrointestinal motility, maybe um, a distension or bloating or IBS types of symptoms, or maybe some constipation. But we've got to expand that to be from not just sluggish GI, but sluggish everything. Sluggish immune function, sluggish kidney function, sluggish um, antioxidant function, sluggish brain, right? Brain fog, sluggish anything. Uh, and so when we go upstream, we've got to be addressing what is happening internal to the cells. We've got to address mitochondrial function. This is where insulin resistance is wreaking havoc on a lot of tissues. But even above that, this is where suboptimal levels of thyroid hormone and suboptimal levels of cortisol, which is a master hormone that primes the receptors for every other hormone in the body, including 
including thyroid hormone. But oh, by the way, you got to have thyroid hormone in the adrenal gland to make cortisol. So there's a real synergistic balance between thyroid hormone and cortisol, uh, which is why the clinical course that deals with that is um, our number one most popular clinical course at SAFM. But there is a lot of subclinical hypothyroid function out there for women, uh, and we are not addressing it. We're not even addressing it poorly. We're not even looking for it because we're still under the massive myth that TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, which by the way is a brain hormone, not a thyroid hormone, we think that that's telling us uh, an accurate uh, biochemically rep linearly representative insight into thyroid function. And that is not true. In fact, I can't even tell you how many times we have done a real life complex case review at SAFM and seen someone with a TSH of 1.7. 2.1, right? Seemingly perfect values, right? Even by the functional standard. But when you actually go to look at what is the thyroid actually doing uh, with regard to T4 uh, and what is the nervous system doing with regard to making that T4 available as free T4? Because just because you make it does not mean the nervous system is making it available uh, by having it be unbound. Um, but even peripheral uh, thyroid hormone synthesis, right? Because the thyroid hormone by and large does not make T3 and T3 is metabolically where it's at. It is free T3 as a thyroid hormone that is the predominant actual stimulation of metabolism in our cells. And people can have perfect TSH and suboptimal or even clinically low T4 levels. If you've been told that's not possible, I got news for you. I've seen it over and over and over and over and over again, right? Which could be autoimmune mediated, but it could also be functional impairment because of lack of nutrients like iodine. But way more commonly, especially in this particular uh, day and age we're living in at the moment, we see maybe optimal levels of TSH, maybe optimal levels of T4 and free T4, but T3 is not being converted. And that's a peripheral conversion that happens primarily in the lining of the intestines, in the liver, in the kidneys, and in other tissues. So if you have a dysbiosis in the gut and enhanced intestinal permeability and inflammatory wear and tear on the lining of the mucosal lining of the intestines so that your uh, risk of food sensitivities is higher, your risk of malnutrition due to malabsorption is higher, but also on top of that, your ability to synthesize T3 is less, period, right? I've seen perfect TSH, perfect T4, and clinically low T3 right? The body may be pumping out a whole ton of reverse T3, which is a inactive form, a storage form, if you will, uh, of thyroid hormone, but the body's not making T3 because that is impaired when the tissue that make that conversion is dysfunctional. That is impaired by inflammation. Certain interleukins directly interfere with the function of the enzymes that convert T4 thyroid hormone to T3. So things like IL-6, coming from the immune system's reaction to excessive levels of lipopolysaccharide because of dysbiosis, because of SIBO, especially when it's paired with leaky gut, right? We know that that's the dynamic. That's one of the primary interleukin profiles that can increase permeability of the blood-brain barrier as well, but that's another topic for another day. But this is directly interfering with cellular thyroid function. And I keep saying cellular, and so often this is subclinical because... Um, well, first of all, plenty of it's clinical. If we were looking at full thyroid panels, we'd actually see it, but you can't find what you're not looking for, folks. Um, but so often, uh, T3 will be barely, it's holding on to the bottom five or 10% of the reference range. Do you think people are thriving? No. And the last thing they need is to be told to go home and just rest more or go home and just have less stress or here, take an antidepressant because all of their symptoms of hypothyroid function, we're not sure what to do with that, right? We've got to start being in better service to that particular dynamic. But uh, cellular, clinical and subclinical hypothyroid uh, function in women is rampant and it is precipitating all sorts of other cellular dysfunction because if you don't put gas in your car, the car's not gonna go. That's not esoteric science, folks. It's really straightforward. If the mitochondria are not optimally fueled internal to the cell for ongoing steady state synthesis of ATP, <clears throat> 
so that a liver cell can do what a liver cell does and a neuron can do what a neuron does and an enterocyte can do what an enterocyte does, right? No gas, no go. And so this is a great example of where we've got to go upstream. Women have LDL cholesterol, elevated LDL, because uh, cellular hypothyroid function reduces the uptake of LDL into the liver. It reduces the, um, the recycling of cortisol that uh, goes through our bile function, which by the way, is the primary way that we're constantly recycling and revitalizing our supply of um, cholesterol. I think I said cortisol a minute ago. I meant cholesterol, right? So we've got to stop saying, oh my gosh, uh, high cholesterol is your diet, right? Stop eating fat. Whew, that is just crazy short-sighted and gets people focusing on the wrong thing. Does their diet maybe need a massive overhaul or they may be eating toxic fats? Yes, but is that the primary place to begin? No, and people are looking to you for wisdom. They are relying on your expertise. They want to take back their health. They want to be empowered. They want to feel that they can actually own their health and get way and stel get well and stay well. But you know what? They're not going to do it until you tell them, looking them in the eye with honesty and warmth and care that it's possible. They need you to tell them it's possible. They need you to lift them up, to educate, inspire, and empower them. All right, so that's my intro. I'm gonna dive into some serious, uh, geeky, technical details here, specifically more on the heart and on the arteries. With that foundation, uh, I wanna talk about a few other things. So we talked about crap food, uh, and not only is crap food a problem because all of the sugars and the sweeteners um, and the high glycemic natures. But crab food is a serious problem, friends, because it's a major, major source of toxicity. Food today is uh, not, well, first of all, it's not just about macronutrients. It's not just about calories. Food is supposed to be laden with micronutrients. And micronutrients are things like um, phytonutrients, right? Uh, the, the flavanols, uh, and the polyphenols and the other things that our bodies have evolved to need to use to change our physiology, right? Sure. You need beta carotene. Sure. You need zinc. Sure. You need a uh, vitamin A. Sure. You need uh, magnesium. You need methionine. You need glycine. Absolutely. All that's necessary. But food, real whole natural food is laden with micronutrients that change the biochemical function in the body. Things like NRF2 activators that stimulate higher activity of the enzyme that's needed to catalyze the synthesis of glutathione, which is our most important intracellular uh, antioxidant, our most important defense against all that pot shot oxidative damage to the cells that line our arteries that are constantly being beat up. It's like a constant boxing match from all of our glucose and all of our toxins and all of our cortisol and adrenaline and advanced glycation end products and lipopolysaccharide from H. pylori and mercury and lead and all of the crap that ends up circulating in our body until our livers and our kidneys uh, and many other tissues try to do the work of processing toxins so that they can be biotransformed that, so we can excrete them. Um, we need good, strong glutathione function, right? But we need whole natural foods to catalyze endogenous antioxidant synthesis. By the way, you got to methylate well in order to make glutathione, right? Another example of the chain of biochemical interconnectedness. We teach a lot about these dynamics, right? And how many of your patients and clients are taking drugs that are interfering with the availability of nutrients that are needed to do these very things? I know I'm jumping around, but let me jump, skip over to that for a minute. Metformin. Wow, great drug. Finally, a diabetes drug that actually works by trying to address the root cause of a disease. And I say that because that's crazy rare, right? The vast majority of the drugs are about fighting the body's natural function and forcing the body to do something it doesn't want to do, which absolutely may save a life. My original love is chemistry, so I totally believe in better living through chemistry. But for forcing the body to stop doing what it's doing because it's a dysfunctional pattern in response to our choices 
only works for a short period of time, which is why so many of the medications that are prescribed in standard of care allopathic medicine eventually end up exacerbating the very disease process that they were originally prescribed to try and support because you cannot long term stop the body from doing what it naturally wants to do without there being massive unintended consequences. Drug may work for a time, right? Beta blocker may absolutely be really powerful triage and stabilization for someone who has stress-mediated cardiovascular disease, like angina, right? Or, or really aggressive hypertension. But a beta blocker uh, has a, a downstream effects because you know what? Adrenaline may precipitate a cardiovascular event in an acute scenario, but adrenaline is not like a rogue substance in the body. It's completely necessary for priming sympathetic dominant nervous system mode, which by the way, we need to survive. Um, and uh, a long-term uh, use of beta blockers also reduces the body's supply of coenzyme Q10 which is critical for mitochondrial function. It decreases melatonin, right? So I'm on a beta blocker to try and whoops, address the effects of stress. And now I'm not, I progressively am not sleeping as well, or I still sleep. So I feel like I'm, I'm rest should be rested, but I wake up the next morning. I'm not rested. My melatonin levels were just barely high enough to allow me to sleep, but you know what? They weren't high enough to allow my arteries to heal. So I'm going to keep having the threat of hypertension forever on these drugs. And I'm going to get all sorts of other peripheral and secondary diseases because of the unintended consequences of that drug. Diuretics, uh, powerful adjunct, uh, sometimes primary, but adjunct therapy to address edema from other hypertension drugs. Great concept. Uh, however, uh, forcing uh, the kidneys to get rid of extra water and sodium. We lose a lot of other electrolytes in the process. And I'll, uh, we stand on the shoulders of a lot of really powerful uh, and courageous uh, leaders in the functional medicine world here at SAFM. And one of my greatest heroes in the cardiovascular world is Dr. Mark Houston. Many of you might be uh, familiar with him. He wrote, has written a really powerful uh, textbook on functional cardiology. Uh, but I still remember, this was about 10 years ago, when he was teaching an entire conference of cardiologists and a few weird people like me about uh, uh, drug media, hypertension drug mediated hypertension. And it was, you could hear a pin drop in the room as all the cardiologists started to try and get their head wrapped around the unintended consequences of long-term use of some of the medications that they had been leaning on and still lean on as standard of care. But people lose excessive amounts of potassium and magnesium along with the sodium and the water while they use diuretic drugs. Well, what are the primary things that we need electrolyte-wise in order to have optimal endothelial function, potassium and magnesium, right? And especially if people are struggling to modulate and improve the balance of potassium and sodium in their diet, they're even more vulnerable to those effects. Throw, you know, the diuretic is kind of like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You lose sodium and you lose that edema, but you're also losing a lot of the precious little potassium that you already had. And magnesium works as a bit of a master electrolyte by increasing the cellular, the intracellular uptake of potassium. We need these. And so, sure, um, we need to remember that could a person who's eating a standard American diet that's laden with fast food, refined food, processed food, be getting like a month's worth of sodium in a few days worth of diet? Yes, absolutely. Table salt is not the enemy, right? In fact, we need salt. Salt is a completely critical electrolyte. In fact, when people have had so much stress and they have chronic simmering infectious dynamics so that the HPATG axis and its wisdom shifts from high cortisol to low cortisol in order to allow the immune system to be stronger, not because the adrenal is exhausted, please stop saying that, and not because the body's weak or stupid or anything else, but because the body knows in its wisdom it's got to fight the infection because whatever other stuff it's trying to get us to do, 
we can die of infections. And so eventually the HPATG axis will switch from having high cortisol levels to having very low cortisol levels. And a hypoadrenal state, if that changes and drops our aldosterone levels and people end up urinating uh, a lot more, they lose their sodium and they crave salt. And it's not their imagination. And they, um, they may indeed need it. Uh, and they feel way, way better once they have it in terms of having optimal electrolyte function that allows these people who have a hypoadrenal state to actually stop having hypotension uh, so that they can feel better. They can have some vitality. Sorry, that was an aside, but a really important point about all electrolytes being critical. Uh, so um, medications, warfarin, whoo, I really get it. I understand thoroughly why warfarin is necessary, uh, especially after uh, cardiovascular surgery. The whole body is freaked out, right? We need to remember that uh, surgery is a very, very stressful traumatic event for the body. And I totally understand why the drugs uh, are um, indicated for a time. Uh, but here's the thing, warfarin works by blocking the action of vitamin K. K1 uh, promotes clotting, promotes healthy clotting in the body, uh, which is really necessary. And, and it's another reason why even for short-term use of warfarin, we need to make sure that we're using just enough as opposed to too much, which can really lead to uh, higher risk of internal bleeding. Um, but vitamin K2 is also inhibited and vitamin K2 is necessary for regulating calcium uptake in our tissues. And in particular, uh, vitamin K2 catalyzes enzymes that directly, um, uh, deter the calcification of soft tissues, which is why in multiple studies, you don't even have to go far. If you do a simple Google, you'll get multiple hits just on the first page about warfarin increasing the risk of arteriosclerosis or hardening of the arteries because it increases, it allows, right? By interfering with the body's natural actions, it allows the uptake of more calcium into the lining of our arteries. So we trade off one potential risk of cardiovascular disease for another because arteriosclerosis uh, absolutely impairs endothelial function and flexibility and, and stops um, our kind of locks us into a pattern of hypertension and stops the natural flexibility that the body needs to have in the cardiovascular system. And so, again, another great example of a drug that is a powerful blessing, and this one is an old school drug, right? But where we think short-term use in order to create a, a runway for taking off into a new lifestyle choice, we got to start telling people up front, there are consequences, dramatic ones right? Ones you don't want to have of long-term use of this drug. So short-term use of it is going to protect you, but I want to partner with you. I'm going to lift you up and educate and inspire and empower you to change your life so that you don't need this drug, so that you don't have to deal with those unintended consequences and secondary disease dynamics. Whew, I could keep going and going, but I want to talk about a few other things. We got to be really cautious, my friends, with overprescribing vitamin D. Vitamin D uh, stimulates increased uptake of calcium uh, in the body. We've got a lot of folks who are on prescription vitamin D taking physician recommended aggressive doses of supplemental calcium. And 50,000 IUs uh, of vitamin D2 on a Monday followed soon later with. 1,500 milligrams of calcium carbonate with lunch is a cardiovascular nightmare. Cardiovascular nightmare. Because we're already kind of deficient in um, magnesium. We already struggle to have optimal levels of vitamin K2. We already have a pro-inflammatory environment in our arteries. Um, bolus aggressive loading of vitamin D, right? It's not really a vitamin, folks, in a traditional nutrient sense. It's a pro-hormone. And it has receptors. And we're not paying attention at all to the receptor dynamics of what's happening with vitamin D. Not everyone well converts D2 to D3. When you put in a massive bolus of vitamin D, you suck up a bolus of magnesium from this person's body in order to convert vitamin D to its final form. Uh, that is a, a major bolus episodic use of magnesium in a person that's probably already insufficient in magnesium. 
And this is why people start taking high dose vitamin D and they start showing symptoms. Well, if you look at those symptoms in my clinical experience, almost every single time, there are symptoms of magnesium deficiency. Replete magnesium before you add vitamin D. Start vitamin D low and slow, just like you would other hormones in order to allow acceptor, receptor adjustment uh, in order to accept the nutrient. Stop recommending such massive doses of supplemental calcium. Spread it out. Tell people how important it is to take it in three or even four separate doses with a meal along with magnesium. Help them to identify food-based sources of calcium that they like and can consume regularly so that the, the, the push of nutri nutrition of calcium is in a slower, more progressive form that actually allows the body to to take it up and make use of it. Anytime you present a bolus of anything to the body, whether it's estrogen or calcium or mercury, the body doesn't deal with bolus things very well. It has a limited capability to manage a bolus of anything. And so to the extent that you overload the body's acceptance mechanism with a massive input, the body's gonna start looking for ways to just store and manage all of the excess. Again, this is perfectly logical. Uh, and so we've gotta start spreading it out. Do, do, do some of our patients and clients need supplemental calcium? Absolutely. Are we recommending they take it in a way that is very safe and healthy? Not at all. Uh, I think that's a place that we've really got to improve. I wanna talk about cardiovascular disease beginning in the gut. And I know I'm frightening my team here. I'm gonna go 10 more minutes and then I'll stop, I promise. Um, hepatic biliary congestion, right? Is the first true root cause of cardiovascular disease in the gut. And the second one, anyone wanna guess? where the, the cardiovascular root, true root causes are most naturally, most frequently in the GI tract? Wanna guess? Anybody know? In the mouth. The mouth, what do you mean, Tracy? <clears throat> Isn't dentistry not medicine? Isn't dentistry this other kind of like weird peripheral practice? Folks, disease begins in the gut. The mouth is the beginning of the gut. The mouth is the top of the downward cascade of disease causality. If you want to go upstream, we've got to help people with dental hygiene. We've got to help people with being hydrated so that their mucous membranes have optimal levels of antibodies, right? Secretory IgA in the mouth is really important, just like secretory IgA is key in nasal respiratory membranes, a really key topic at present in this pandemic. Also in the lining of the, the gut. But uh, yes, exactly, right? Gingivitis, um, any type of oral infection, uh, is a really high predisposing factor for cardiovascular disease because what happens in the gut does not stay in the gut. What happens in the mouth does not stay in the mouth, right? Root canals, right? Chronic simmering infectious dynamics way down in the space of a root canal that does not get fully filled by root canal backfilling material because of natural shrinkage after curing is a root cause of cardiovascular disease, right? Dental care. We got to start talking to people about their dental history. If people are very stressed, they're at a higher risk of infections of, of all kind. We know that, right? But especially dental infections. And if they're practicing poor oral hygiene, if they're not well hydrated, if they're eating a lot of sugar and crap food, does that risk go up? Of course it does. That's not rocket science. Um, Disease begins in the gut, right? H. pylori overgrowth, right? And I say H. pylori overgrowth, not infection, because H. pylori is endemic in humans, basically. It's just a question of overgrowth, right? As a result of our defenses being down, another powerful example that the best way to, to, to not get sick is to stay well. The best repellent to disease is health, and health is way, way, way more than the absence of disease. Um, so we've got to think about uh, infectious dynamics and especially beginning in the mouth and good oral hygiene and uh, dental care. Hepatic biliary congestion. Whew. Um, when we are dehydrated, when we're in a high stress state, when we have hypothyroid function, when we're dealing with an excess of estrogen, which can affect men and women, we get thick sluggish bile. 
and bile is made in the liver and it flows through the biliary tree and it's stored in the gallbladder. So gallbladder disease, gallstones do not begin in the gallbladder, my friends, they begin in the liver. Uh, so when you're looking for root causes of that, we need to be looking further upstream. We need to stop waiting for gamma glutamyl uh, S transferase and alkaline phosphatase to be clinically high before we say, hmm, maybe there is a gallbladder problem. We need to be looking for these markers to be in the upper third, even of the normal reference range and start to look for other evidence of congestion in this flow because that is how toxins get from the liver into the GI tract to allow excretion. If we don't support that, then the liver becomes overloaded with toxins. And, and instead of phase three going into the GI tract to get rid of toxins, we're just gonna reabsorb that crap right back into circulation and the body's gonna go deposit it somewhere, like in our brain or our adipose tissue because a lot of toxins have a high, are lipophilic, have a high affinity for fatty tissue. So we gotta start looking for that. Having optimal hydration is a super easy every day. I mean, bile is, bile is a smoothie basically. And just like a smoothie you might put in your blender, you gotta have the right ingredients. If you don't have enough water in your smoothie, you just have a whole bunch of fruit and some powders and you try to blend it, that crap looks really appetizing and it's not gonna go down very well. It's thick and has clumps in it. It's the exact same thing with your bile. You want free flowing bile, which requires amino acids like uh, glycine uh, and taurine. And, and taurine is made through uh, methylation and sulfation. Really needs vitamin B6, which is deficient. And I bet the vast majority of your patients who are taking oral birth control pills. Another topic for another day. But by, if bile is thick and sluggish, it is not going to flow smoothly through the biliary tree. It's going to gunk up the works, right? Use simple analogies your patients and clients can understand. Hoses that have, have crap gunked up on the inside don't work very well, right? They get backed up. Uh, they can easily get damage on the lining of the hose. It's the same for your hepatic biliary tree, just like it is for your cardiovascular system, which is basically a pump and hoses. Uh, but we've got to start looking more keenly, more upstream about where there's hepatic biliary congestion and we've got to start addressing it. And you can really help that. D-limonene is a really powerful supplement that's been shown to not only improve but reverse hepatic biliary congestion and actually in a targeted multi-dosing will dissolve gallstones, especially if we catch them when they're smaller. Uh, supplemental taurine or glycine may be appropriate. Hydration uh, is really appropriate. Um, but we've got to start thinking about supporting the liver and the, the biliary tree in combination. Um, fructose. You've got to start talking to folks about fructose like it's a poison. Really fascinating studies looking at, um, you know, even if you replace glucose in the body with a calorically equal amount of fructose, liver fat goes up by nearly 40% in, wait for it, one week. One week, one week. Fructose is like alcohol, right? It can only be metabolized in the liver. And we are dealing with a glut of fructose in an environment where our livers are already a bit overwhelmed. We got to start talking to people about uh, heavy uh, fructose loads, just like we would talk to them about excessive um, alcohol uh, intake. Uh, so, um, Food is definitely important. We could talk more and more and more about toxicity. Vitamin K2, I think is a really, vitamin K2 with essential omega-3 fats, super important for um, uh, preventing calcification of the lining of arteries, as well as reducing stress, reducing toxins, reducing crap food. You know, the thing is, no matter how many fancy esoteric conferences you go to and know how, ma how many certifications you receive or how many edge of technology medical studies you read, I read, here's the truth. We are never, ever, ever gonna get out from under the simple, powerful, not so sexy, but absolutely essential, everyday foundational health promoting choices. Sleep, hydration, real food, toxin avoidance, detoxification support, joy, oxygen, nature, 
In terms of cardiovascular disease, sleep apnea is rampant in your practice. Are you looking for it? Are you looking for the absence of oxygen, which is causing, causing mitochondrial dysfunction? And mitochondrial density is the highest in muscle tissue. And what's the most important muscle in the body? The heart right? Everything that affects mitochondria, whether it's toxins or impaired oxygen or insufficient B vitamins, makes perfect sense. It's going to start affecting the heart progressively more and more over time. Because if there's one muscle that's working all the time at every moment of our living and breathing life, it is the heart. Uh, and so mitochondrial function is uh, really, really critical, which again brings into question, we're taking a lot of statin drugs, uh, which if we're not really carefully supplementing with CoQ10 in order to provide that critical coenzyme to support mitochondrial function, at what point are we giving statins, which definitely help, in particular because uh, they have a anti-inflammatory effect. I actually think they would be more effective if they did not reduce cholesterol as much, but that's another topic for another day. But they, they've definitely been shown at, to be effective as triage and stabilization when a cardiovascular event has already happen, especially in men in their 50s and 60s. Very focused use, right? Like any company, they want to make more money. They're looking for widespread use. Let's put them in a box next to the cash register at a restaurant. Crazy talk. Um, but coenzyme Q10, critical for mitochondrial function. So at what point is long-term high-dose statin use begin to have an impact on the mitochondria of our most important muscle, our heart? So the arteries look squeaky clean, but the heart tissue is not as strong as it optimally wants to be. But the heart is really resilient, and so it doesn't start to show those effects until five years later, seven years later, 12 years later, right? We don't necessarily associate it with the drug because it's far distant down the runaway chain, the runaway train chain of causality. But at what point does that start to have an effect? Unintended long-term consequences. Got to start thinking about these things. I have to stop my friends because if you're a longtime follower of us here at SAFM, you know I would happily go on and on and on and on. Thank you so much for what you're doing in the world and being part of our family here out on the leading edge of healthcare transformation. Uh, I'm very grateful that you're here. Have a great day, folks.